Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country called Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with London, Ontario City Councillor Susan Stevenson. But before we enter into our interview with Councillor Stevenson, we would like to say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content like the one you're about to see today that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission, which I hope you do, and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked on our website at crossborderinterviews.ca. Now, every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can deliver the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, on to the show. Councillor Stevenson, thank you so much for doing this. I want to start with my first question and to get this out of the way before we get into the crux of the interview. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, it actually came from considering vote not voting for the first time in my life. I was just so uh, frustrated with politics in general and the seemingly lack of um, ability for the people to have a say in what was happening that I was considering not voting and instantly realized that was not an option. <laughs> and so I thought, well, then I guess I get to put my name in and see if I can make a change from there. And was it always municipally that you wanted to get involved in or was there a, an idea that, okay, where is the best... Uh, place for my voice to give back to my community and give a voice to those people like myself who don't feel enfranchised with um, politics right now? Yeah, honestly, I never really thought about running at any level. And but the not wanting to vote happened at the municipal level. And so um, and then I had heard that it was, uh, you know, the place where you could have the most impact, be closest to the people. And that really appealed to me. So I put my name forward. Were you a politically astute kid growing up or was politics something that you didn't come by and was not ever interested in? <laughs> That's funny. My dad was very interested in politics and I, he tried to talk to me about it at every opportunity. I tried to avoid it at every opportunity. And um, when I was a little bit older and raising my kids and I didn't like the way things were going, I just canceled the newspaper, stopped watching the news. It was probably like 20 years. I just tuned the world out did my own thing, and uh, then woke up and said, what the heck happened? <laughs> so, um, and municipal politics, embarrassingly, I did not participate at all, really. I would, you know, w watch the debate for mayor and and pick that. Uh, Councillor, truthfully, I didn't really pay much attention, just picked something. And uh, now that I realize the impact and the difference that that makes, I, that will never happen again. Um, but no, so I had a huge learning curve. And last year when I was campaigning, I watched videos of old committee meetings trying to get up to speed because I knew nothing about what they did, what the roles were, that there were even committees, what happened. And it just blew my mind to find out that the, what decisions are made at the municipal level that impact us so greatly. When you were door knocking in 2022, when you first put your name forward, did you hear the same sentiment from the people that you were talking to that they were tuned out? They didn't really care as long as their water turned on and their garbage was picked up. They were happy with, with the way the municipal government was going on. And until someone like yourself who said, no, there's actually things that are going on and we need to be paying attention because it impacts us the most. We need someone like myself on that council table. What were you hearing at the doors when it came to the apathy around municipal government yeah well i you know my own theory uh on that is that the reason like our voter turnout was 25 percent, and oh. um <laughs> I, I i really believe it's people just feeling like what's the point like does it make a difference and um there definitely was an interest in new you know when i said it was the first time that i ran they said okay you have my vote right like they wanted somebody totally new hadn't been in there before uh, there really was a, a frustration with uh, things that were happening here in our city that you just feel like no one's listening or, uh, you know, who is in charge here and what's going on because it didn't, it doesn't resonate, I don't think, with the majority of people and I still don't think so. So I do think that as I was
was honest with people. If they asked me why I was running, people really got it. Some would say to me, truthfully, I just, I just can't. You get in there, you do what you say you're going to do, I'll vote for you next time. But I'm just not, not even going to have the hope that that would actually happen. So how do you how do you think of yourself as an olive branch then? Because I can imagine when you hear those stories, you want to change that attitude and that mindset of people as a newly elected councillor who is trying to uh, do things differently and try to get people engaged and get people involved. Like Because I see you on social media, you're actively on social media, you're actively hosting town halls. Um, yeah. How do you see yourself as that olive branch of bringing, uh, bridging the divide between the people who just don't care about municipal politics don't think there's any going to be any change in you who knows that they're going to be changed because I was just elected and I want to see that change happen yeah I think it's a willingness to engage with the public right there just seems to be some fear around having difficult conversations around you know creating the space to have them so the town hall you know there was 150 people came And that's just mind boggling considering I have a small email list. I didn't advertise it in any great way, but people are hungry to know what is going on. What are the problems and how can we uh, participate in that if there's actually a chance at it, right? Like I think people really genuinely are interested. And I think we're at a unique point in time where people are not comfortable right? So I'll speak coming from me, right? There was a lot that I saw that wasn't, that I didn't like, but was I willing to actually do anything about it? No, because everything was okay. But then when things start to not be okay, now all of a sudden people are engaged. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of people are having a very difficult time right now, or somebody they know and love is having a very difficult time right now. And, but it, the, the silver lining to that is people wake up and they start to get involved and they are willing to take action or speak up when maybe they weren't willing to before. I'm using that analogy that you just gave there for a sec for this question. Do you find that municipal governance is more reactive than proactive? Because you just openly admitted that I was okay with everything that was going on until it started to affect me. So I started to react more into the uh, areas that it was affecting me. Do you find that even today, like people in general and even municipal governments are being more reactive to issues than being proactive on issues? Yes, and I think that is a tendency that that it happens and trying to get out of that is challenging. And um, it's also, it, it's a bit of more of a risk sometimes to be proactive. You know, oftentimes we, we need to be forced into making changes. And I think that's just human nature to a certain degree. I want to talk about the role of a counselor here for a second before we get into the big issues of London as a whole. Uh, you you were elected in 2022. You're coming up to a year in office. So a year ago, you were just heading into the final stretch of your campaign. Um, what's been the biggest eye-opening experience for yourself? Because you, 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 you're considered a green candidate. You didn't really know much about municipal politics. You did a bit of research. You get elected. And then you get thrown into the deep end because you are like municipal government is the deep end. What was yeah. the biggest learning curve for yourself when you got elected to now? Oh gosh, there's been so many learning curves. Like it's just been a a sea of learning curves. Um, it was, it was, it was, is it learning curve you want to know or the eye, what was the most eye-opening? Whatever way you wanted to answer that question. So if there was an eye-opening experience that you said, wow, I did not expect this to be what we'd be dealing with, or this is what we'd be talking about, or, okay, as someone who really didn't follow municipal politics, this was the hardest part to overcome. Because in Alberta, we're heading into an election, a municipal election two years from now. Saskatchewan's heading into a municipal election. So there's a lot of municipal candidates out there who are going, should I get involved? And if they're listening to this, what advice would you give that okay, this is going to be the most eye-opening experience for you or the biggest learning curve. Oh, wow. Well, if somebody's considering running, I would definitely say do it just because (laughs) we need to. I mean, I listened to a speech a few years ago that I've never forgotten where the, the, the person talking said, you know, I know you don't want to be on the committees and I know you don't want to run and I know you don't want to attend the meetings, but if you don't, the people who want to control you will. 
right? So many of us just want to live our lives, just want to be left alone. But the truth is that if we don't take action, if we don't get on the committees and have and have a voice, then what we end up with is a small minority of people that really want to tell us all what to do, that then they are the ones running. And so I think sort of the average person just needs to make that you know, civic service, public service stance, whoever's called to it. It's not for everybody. Um, certainly running, I have a new appreciation and uh, uh, respect for anybody who has gone through that process. And I was lucky enough to get the honor of this position the first time around. Um, but I, the most eye-opening thing, I think I knew I would only be one vote out of 15. Um, but it is, in my experience so far, so much bigger than that. Like, I, I feel like things come to us done, just ready for a stamp of approval and a thank you. And if we have questions about it, there's no time for that. And there's the, the lack of information has been astounding for me, like that I can't get uh, the details or the financial backing to things that we're doing at the city. Um, I don't know, the accountant in me just can't understand the lack of transparency. So the fact that it's uh, it's not just one, like it's like who is in control here because it doesn't feel like it's council. And if it isn't, and this might be unique to us, I don't know, but then- It's not, we, I will put that out there right now. <laughs> I'm hearing this story a lot too, counselor. <laughs> really, really. Yeah, so again, I mean, we can go victim to it or we can say, okay, look, ultimately I am responsible and I answer to the people and this is supposed to be customer service. And so we get to take the reins of power back and I don't know how to do that, but I think that it's time for the people's elected officials to have a say and to ensure that they have a say or to fight that fight, whatever it looks like. And I think the people are ready to do that because at least here in London and my, my particular area is uh, on fire right now in terms of the mental health and addiction and the core area uh, on top of, you know, other issues. And um, the people want change. And I, and I think that we're at a unique point in time where everything's happening at once, where we, I think, I'm feeling quite optimistic that we're going to see some dramatic changes here. We're, we're going to talk about the issues in, in about two seconds here, but I want to end on this question before we turn into the issues. You're elected in October. You've made some pretty tough ch uh, votes in the last year, I'm assuming, whether it be budget, whether it be going into the next budget, whether it be planning, whether it be this, that or the other. And you have to stand by the decisions that you make. Is it hard to make decisions that are going to impact your neighbors, your family members, your community members, the people who voted for you and look at them the day after in the grocery store, or at the park, wherever you see them and say, I had to make this vote because of X. I had to do this because I believe in the best that it will help our community grow further. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself that every time you go into that council chambers, you're making the best choice for the community as a whole? Hmm, that's interesting. I certainly and I've asked that question a lot. Difficult to... votes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I certainly have uh, had to make some difficult votes, but funny, it doesn't weigh on me because I really, really truthfully believe I made the right decision and I I'm willing to stand in that and have the conversation and uh, I don't shy away from it. So I know there are, you know, on, on most important issues, there's almost a 50, 50 split. And so I'm not going to make everybody happy. And I get that, but hopefully over the course of the period of time, you know, there'll be some votes that will go say their way, some won't. And if I truly believe, and I can justify why I made the choice that I have, it, it doesn't weigh that heavily on me, interestingly. Does it does it weigh on you balancing the needs of your ward with the needs of the city because you're there to represent the people and correct me if I'm wrong here of Ward Four, and yes. and but when you're sworn in you're not sworn in as a Ward Four councillor you're sworn in as a City of London councillor so you have to look at every issue as a citywide issue not just an individual yeah. issue how do you balance that role and aspect of the job. Yeah, so far that hasn't happened. Like, it, it, you know, what I haven't, there, there might come a time, I know there are times when, you know, you have to choose something that, you know, doesn't go both ways. But so far, anything I've pushed for, I believe is good for the ward and good for the city. Okay. Uh, so I haven't had that. How would I do it? Well, I think, you know, again, 
I, I'm elected to to be a leader for the city first, representing my ward. So I, I would go for what was best for the city and just have to explain that and maybe be able to find some way to find a win in it, right? Like, what can we do to have some kind of a win? So I want to turn to the the issues now. And before I ask this question, because we seem to get emails about this question a lot for some reason, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. I don't know need. I don't know how many times I have to say that, but this is her the councillor's opinion. Um, okay. Councillor, in your opinion. What are the biggest issues or issue facing the city of London today as of recording this episode? Uh, I think the biggest issue is our downtown core areas and the homelessness addiction. It's a, it's, it's a crisis that is really threatening our city, quite frankly. But I do believe we're at a precipice and it could be glorious. Like there's so many good and amazing things that we could it could be great, but without, in my opinion, changing direction from the course that we're on, it could be uh, very much a bad story for our city. So how do we fix it? How do you as a counselor <laughs> add? And I know I know you're you kind of laugh because it's the million dollar question because mm -hmm. there's no quick fix. But um, I, the downtown core is a big issue that you'd have to fix because there's a lot of things going on. I've had the pleasure of sitting down with one of your uh, fellow council members, but also I've had the pleasure of going through London and living in London for a bit. So I know it uh, quite well. So I, I want to know, how do you see yourself in your role as councillor and council as a whole in trying to address the issues that are facing the downtown core and the mental health issues in your community? I think the biggest thing is being willing to have the difficult conversations. I mean, I'm sure we're doing a lot of great things, but there is something that we are doing that is not working, right? Based on results and the level of violence and crime and the level of homelessness and addiction that we're seeing on our streets, the number of businesses who've closed or are very soon going to close and the people who don't feel safe coming down to their city and walking around. So right now, everyone is losing. Our homeless and addicted population is not well and they are growing and it is not good. And our business community is truthfully barely surviving and our neighborhood community is really suffering. And so right now everybody is losing. We are spending a lot of money and no one is winning. We're managing problems and shuffling them around and it's not sustainable. And I understand, and maybe I don't understand how complex it is and how risky it is to make change. But that is where the magic happens, is being willing. I, you know, I said in the town hall, iron sharpens iron as long as we're not stabbing each other. And there's a lot of stabbing each other right now. And I just wanna create the space where we can actually talk and we're not fighting against each other and not pitting one group against another, right? It isn't about ten tenants versus developers and the homeless and addicted versus the businesses. And it's not the social service agencies against the homeowners. It doesn't need to be that way. So when any one of these three groups starts to get better and do well, then all it, we all do better. So this, this spiral down that we have right now is going to be beautiful when it's a spiral up. But if no one can admit what's wrong and we're all in a defensive position, um, then unfortunately we're not going to make much headway. And there are lives at risk, not just the homeless and addicted, but there's a lot of lives at risk. So you, you talk about many issues that, traditionally don't fall under the realm of the municipal jurisdictional uh, purview of what the municipal government should do. Mental health and addiction is traditionally a provincial issue. Crime is traditionally a provincial and federal issue. Now, municipalities are doing this a lot by themselves right now until the federal and provincial governments get to the table. Are there discussions happening right now with the, your, your provincial and federal counterparts to say, okay, we're having these tough conversations, but we're not just having them by ourselves. We're not just sitting in an echo chamber of, as the city of London and dealing with this issue by ourselves. We're actually actively engaging with our provincial and federal counterparts or, and even the business community, because as you said, the Chamber of Commerce and the business communities are also suffering a little bit in the downtown core. We need to bring them on table. So we need to, everyone to come to the table and have these hard conversations. Is it happening? Um, <laughs> you know, 
there is um it, it, i said this the other day too you know we, we have public engagement but are we committed to the engagement part so we can go through the motions sometimes we can tick the box we can say we did it but you know, I, I prefer more to focus on the outcomes. If we haven't made a difference, it really doesn't matter that we did all 10 steps out of the 10 steps. Because if we didn't change anything, you know, it doesn't work. You know, you said you're in Alberta. I would have loved to have been in Edmonton uh, these last couple of days for the Safer Cities Conference that is being held in Edmonton right now. Yeah. Um, I do, you know, in your province too, you've got more of a, uh, the Alberta model is something I'm watching quite closely in terms of the mental health and addiction. We get to look at what's working and what's not. And I, I think, you know, are the conversations happening? As far as I understand, yes, they are. Are they open and transparent? Do we know what's happening? No. Um, are the right people at the table? I have no idea, you know, uh, you, but you, I talk to a lot of moms of addicts who are on our streets and, um, you know, we are not, we are not doing well for them. Now, you have been very active on social media when it comes to, to this issue. And now, as I said uh, earlier in the interview, you just hosted a town hall and it was, uh, uh, I think you said 150 residents yeah. came out. What was the general consensus of what people's frustrations or what were you hearing from the people who were at that? Because you talk about engagement and engagement is a huge part, but listening is also another part, right? You can't just yeah. sit there and engage with them and talk to them, but you have to listen and take their feedback and try to make what they're saying into a reality for them. What were people saying at that uh, public hearing that you just hosted? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in a way, it was good, too. We had a diverse array of opinions, and we had people offended on both sides. And, you know, <laughs> you know, you're doing happens. your job right when <laughs> and it happens. And it's being able to create a respectful place and to sit in that discomfort of the fact that we see the world very differently, right? To a certain degree, even our outcomes are not the same. I do not believe that we all want the same thing. Um, and so we're not talking about it, though. So we just keep moving forward and it's like, we need to have those hard conversations and um, I, why I is it, why is it hard to have the hard conversations? Why don't people want to have the hard conversations in your opinion, as a relatively new politician? Uh, why do you think people are so apprehensive about having the hard conversations around issues like mental health and addiction or even homeless or crime? It's, it's scary, right? It's scary. You feel like you don't know enough. I don't know enough to say anything. I'm not an expert. I, I don't want to be attacked. There's a lot of attacking, right? If you are, if you say anything against what's currently happening now, you're not compassionate. You're, you know, I, I've been called racist. I mean, anti-homeless. I mean, there's just like this complete uh, attack and people don't want that. People are stressed out enough then to uh, step into that uh, frenzy. I think I've, you know, people watch what's been happening to me. You can see why people do not engage in these conversations. And, um, but to create, I, I mean, I grew up trying to avoid making mistakes and trying to avoid conflict most of my life, right? And I think most of us are like that. Um, and how do we sort of build those skills of being willing to be wrong, being willing to make a mistake, to be risky, to express yourself and, uh, allow iron to sharpen iron and not make it shameful. You know, if I don't speak out and I don't have somebody correct me, I'm going to continue to think what I think. And if we just hang around people who think the way we think, and we are all in our silos, uh, you know, then as a community, we're not going to move forward. We're not going to heal. It's, it's together where we're going to be able to make a difference. You talk about being in silos, and it's one of my biggest pet peeves when it comes to municipal politicians, because you, you sit and you talk uh, on social media, you sit with your coffee groups, you sit with your friends, and that's where you get your opinions. But for you, it seems like you, you're you kind of going against the grain here, because you said you're willing to sit and have those uncomfortable conversations with people who vehemently disagree with you, particularly at that public hearing. Why is it important for you to hear both sides of the story? And why should more politicians and at all levels, in some ways, be more like you and actually listen to both sides and not be disrespectful to them? Hmm. 
Well, when I got out of accounting in 2017, I went to work for a leadership and character development uh, seminar company, and they, they did experiential seminars around leading and character development. You know, each one of us is a leader in our life in some area, right? And to step into that role fully. And I learned so much. <laughs> I learned so much in that time. And um, to, to realize that we literally see the world differently. You and I can look at a book and we will see it differently. I see the front cover, you see the back. Both of them are true. We're looking at the same book, right? But but I see a different view than you see with your history, with your um, everything else. And so I am the kind of person that likes to know things. I like to learn things. And I had been quite frustrated, quite frankly, in my life, not being able to, I was not like, why am I not communicating? Well, why can you not see what I see? I'm looking at the book. It's real. That's what I see. Once I realized you saw a different side of the book than I could see, now I want to know. What is it that I don't know? What is it that I can't see? Because I like to know everything. Um, and so it creates a sense of curiosity. And, you know, with all the political um, division that we're seeing, uh, it happens within my own family and within friend groups such that uh, I've been forced, in a sense, to hold that space of how can we be, like, adamantly opposed ideologically and still be in relationship and still maybe even discuss the challenging issues. I, I, I traditionally don't try to interject into conversations like this until the end, but I want to say this. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because this is where the show has always come from is I may not agree a hundred percent of the time with every single one of my guests, but I believe that if we don't sit down and have a conversation with everyone and understand where people are coming from, our country is in a bad place if that doesn't happen. And I appreciate you taking time and saying that statement because I am in the same opinion as you. You, you and I will look at the exact same book as take your analogy. We may say two different things. You may like the book. I may dislike the book. But at the end of the day, the book is still a book. The book is still there. It's not going to change. So thank you so much for saying that, Counselor. God, I love this conversation already. <laughs> so on the flip side to that, you're hearing all these different issues. You're hearing from both sides of this, is, these issues. And now you have to take it as a counselor and bring it forward to uh, your council meetings, to your committee meetings, and you sort of have to put those plans in actions or hopefully give a voice to those people who don't feel like they have a voice. Have you been able to do that? And have you been able to find a way that you're, you're listening, you're engaging, but you're also doing and that's the biggest part about municipal politics is the doing part because you can listen you can engage but if you if there's no concrete action there's nothing going to happen so how can we say okay councillor stevenson is actually doing what she's saying she's trying to be more transparent she's trying to get more uh people to have these tough conversations besides public hearings what else are you doing to make sure these issues don't fall on deaf ears well there's a lot in there <laughs> You, you hit on my frustration point, which is, am I actually doing anything, right? Because I'm getting a ton of encouragement and so many people from across the city reaching out to me to say, thank you. Like, finally, somebody is saying what we've all been talking about and nobody else is saying. And that feels great. And that was part of why I ran, was to give them what I felt, the majority, a voice. And, but at the same time, I want to do something. Like, this isn't just about listening and and speaking it, I actually want to be an agent of change. And that is my frustration point is I maybe, you know, it's, 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 it hasn't been that long yet. And we have urgent crises that are facing us. Like we don't have time for me to have a big, long learning curve or to, so, so there's this sense of urgency that is challenging. Um, and so then another growth opportunity for me is I can't do this alone right? It, even City Hall, we can make decisions. We're not going to fix the problems that the city faces alone. So it's like, what is the piece that only City Hall can do? We have a new police chief. What, what is the piece that he can do? Our business community, they're going to get to do something different than they've been doing already. Our social service agencies are going to get to look at things differently. And our community is going to have to rally and 
step out of their comfort zone and do things that they haven't done before. And we're all going to have to do it at once. You know, we, we need to be in alignment and move forward uh, together. Now, you talk about the last piece of the puzzle that I didn't even mention, the people. The people actually have to have buy-in on this as well, whether it be a tough issue like homelessness, tough issues like addiction, tough issues like uh, crime, or even easy issues like parks or pools or whatever. You need buy-in from the community. You talk about in your story that you were apathetic when it came to municipal governments until you didn't see someone uh, that you could vote for. Is there still an apathy in London where they're willing to actually give you the, their feedback or give you the ideas or get out and actually have these tough conversations and get involved and actually make a difference? Because if city hall and provincial federal governments, chamber of commerce does their part, it doesn't go all the way until you get the buy-in from the people to say, okay, this is how we're going to have to make a change. And we're going to need a community effort to do it and not just an individualized effort to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think a big piece of that is educating people, right? Like I didn't know. And so then even if people are frustrated, they don't know who to be frustrated with or what exactly (laughs) is the problem. (laughs) And, you know, in our last election, we had one uh, group organize a debate, but other than that, there was no debate. A lot of it wasn't covered. Um, You know, local newspapers aren't what they used to be. A lot of it was online. Some people aren't online. Um, so a lot of times people don't know what the problems are until it's literally in their backyard or on their way to work and they see it and it's already after the fact. And so in a day and age of information, like we're in the information age, there's so little information available unless you're willing, you know, unless you'd like to watch hours of committee meetings and read all the things. And a lot of people don't. Or they don't have the time, even if they wanted to. And so how can we get make it a more informed public so that it can, the public service can do what they want because they have an opportunity to say. And I'm trying to figure that out. Like, how can I get people to be informed? Even as a counselor, I'm frustrated that I don't feel informed. I don't get the information. And I've expressed that to say, I'm an educated woman. Like, show me the plan. Show me the numbers. Let me look at it. Take my expertise. Let it be a value in the little piece that I can offer rather than just present it a fait accompli. Uh, I'm cautious of time here. And I want to just ask this last question before we turn to our last segment here. You probably deal with a lot of issues on a regular basis. You talk about the issues that are important to you, tackling this uh, houseless, homelessness, homelessness and addictions, uh, mental health uh, issues. But there are residents who come to you on a daily basis and probably give you their opinions on what the issues are. And you probably have heard the gambit of them, whether it be a pothole in front of my house, whether it be parking on my street, this, that or the other. How do you wait, uh, weed through what the city needs and what you believe needs to happen with the individual needs as well? Because you're there to represent the people of your ward and you can't yeah. forget them. So you have to advocate for them as well. And you know, and I know, and FCM is prominently saying this right now, municipalities don't have a lot of money right now to do what they want to do. Yeah. And I just saw, if I'm not mistaken, one of your uh, most recent, I think, a budget uh, post that you made where Mm -hmm. it could go up, I think, 15 percent or 13 percent. One of our cities posted out, yeah, in Ontario, that the draft budget came out at 14.2 or something. And yeah, yeah, it's going to be a crazy budget time. um, How are you going to go into this and make sure that everyone feels like they've uh, they, they feel like they're being helped by the city? but also understanding that some people are not going to be helped because you don't have enough money to help every single person with their issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really think it's about putting first things first. Like if we get the big things right, the rest will fall into place. Whereas if we start chasing some of the smaller things, then the big things get missed. And I, what I ran on last year was I said, um, you know, I, we can't be raising property taxes and we can't be saying no to things that are really important. And so we get to lead by example, just like the residents are going to have to figure it out. They're going to have to figure out their monthly expenses, even though gas is going up and utilities are going up and insurance is up and interest rates are up. The city's going to have to do that too. We're going to have to figure out how we can do it, do what's most important 
and not raise property taxes. And I think, again, the silver lining in the cloud is that we're going to get to look under the hood at all of the massive programming that we spend a billion dollars a year on and really take a look at it because it's accumulated over time. And I think just like homeowners will do that, look through and say, oh, I didn't realize I was spending that much here or there. I don't really need that. Um, we're going to get to do that too. And how we're going to find the time or be able to pry that hood open, I'm not sure. I appreciate your honesty there. Um, I want to turn to the last segment because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy counselor. So I want to talk about my favorite subject because I think we always need to end on a positive note on this show because mm -hmm. I, I think it's important that more municipalities focus on tourism because I like tourism and that's the only reason. <laughs> Um, counselor, what are some hidden gems in London or even in Ward 4 that if people come to your community, they need to see? Yeah, well, in Ward 4, we are blessed to have 100 Kellogg Lane, which was the old Kellogg cereal factory that uh, we had some amazing uh, private investors purchase that property and then transform it into uh, an entertainment district. So we have the factory, which is Canada's largest indoor ropes and trampoline area. We've got the clubhouse, which is virtual sports, uh, you know, sitting on your comfortable leather sofas, you can play whatever kind of virtual sports you want. Next year, we're getting the first Canada's first hard rock hotel there in that location. And um, yeah, so it's a very exciting, uh, the, the, I can't remember now how much money they've invested in that property, but it's a huge private investment that is going to be, um, it's going to change that whole area and has been, word hasn't gotten out. I think it's a hidden gem, but it's going to be something fantastic. They just too had the Van Gogh, Monet, and just recently the Disney immersive experience. So we, it's going to be a big tourist attraction. Where do you go in the community to decompress after a long day, which it sounds like you have lots of them uh, after a long day of council meetings or even public hearings or meeting with constituents? Where do you go in the community to just let it all go unwind and just recenter yourself? Because, you know, tomorrow <laughs> is a new day and it's a bigger, more meetings that you're, are on the agenda. So where do you go in the community? Yeah, yeah. You know what? That is an area of growth for me too. I get to do more of that. But I really do like to go into the woods and be on the trails. We have some beautiful, we have the Thames River in London and it's a beautiful spot to go. I'm a coffee girl. So a local cafe uh, is a place to go. And we have some amazing ethnic restaurants and a lot of live music and all of those things fill my soul. So I'm going to end on the last question here. And FYI, I'm a coffee boy as well. So <laughs> when I'm in London next, let's go grab a coffee. Okay, okay. Uh, I want to end on my last question. It's the million dollar question. I think every municipal councillor or mayor needs to be able to answer this. And I think everyone has been able to answer it correctly. In your opinion, councillor, what makes the city of London such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Oh, wow. The most unique. It's the people, right? It's always the people and the small businesses and uh, the way people come together and express themselves through arts and food and culture. For sure. Uh, that's it. Counselor, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this. You have just given me a rejuvenation that I need it so badly because you talk about needing to talk to both sides of the story. And I appreciate your honesty in that. So thank you so much for sitting down and thank you for serving. Thank you for stepping up and serving your communities. I don't think municipal counselors get enough to do and you guys do the hard work and I appreciate that. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for giving us the time to uh, share our stories. It's appreciated. I want to thank our guests for joining us today for a great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And I want to thank you for listening or even watching this episode. Your continued support and interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to what we're doing here on the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is our hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics through our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a pivotal role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. 
Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page linked in our show notes and on our website at crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.